if I told you I had a way that you could outperform all your competitors on a couple of key financial measures, like profitability and return on equity, would you do it? Yes? yes? Of course you would. And I've got the answer. Hire more executive women. <laughs> the research is there. You can make the business case for it. But why isn't it happening? Why aren't there more women at the top of corporate America? This is my passion. All girls high school, all women's college, 30 years at Time Warner, made it to the C-suite. Now I'm doing leadership development, consulting work, and executive coaching for women. It's my passion. It always has been. I want to see more women get to the top. And it's also the mission of my firm. We want to have an impact. We want to move the needle. To that end, we published a women's leadership book last year, and we put forth our big vision. We call it our red suit vision. We want to see 30% representation of women in corporate America in 10 years. Now, the book came out last year, so we're in year number nine, and we've got to get going. What's the red suit part of this? If you will, visualize executive women in red suits, executive men in gray suits, and let's go into a corporate boardroom. A corporate boardroom today is about 10 people, person on either end, four on either side, and right now we have one red suit at that table, one. If we can get 30%, think about it, there'll be three red suits at that table. I've been the only red suit at the table. How many women out there have, have been the only woman in the room at certain meetings? All right, Mo a lot of you. Well, I certainly have. And it doesn't feel real comfortable. You feel awkward. You sort of want to blend into the wallpaper and, and so people don't really know you're there. Hard to get your voice out. I'm now on a board of 12 and there are four women on the board. Do you know what a difference that is? How empowered I feel to speak up right from the beginning, getting my voice at the, at the table. So that's what we want to say. We think 30% is a tipping point. We think when there are 30% women at the top of corporate America, the dialogue, the conversation will change. And I'm not advocating for all women at the table or all men at the table. We need both. We need both leadership styles. We need that conversation because I believe corporate America will be better run when we can have 30% women at the top of corporate America. That's where I want to go. So in my firm, we've talked about what's, what's going on here, what's not happening, why aren't there more women? If you'd asked me at the height of my career, would I be up here talking about this? I would have said, oh no, it's all going to be fixed. But it hasn't been fixed. So let me start. Some of you folks out there may be saying, did she say there's research that proves this? Let me show you the research. So I got, I got you, didn't I? I knew, I knew what was going on in your heads. There's research, and I will, if you give me your card on the break, I will send it to you via email. There's research out there that having more women in senior management improves your financial performance, increases your level of innovation, which you'll be hearing about today. And on certain measurements like leadership and accountability, you get better rankings. So there's a lot of data out there saying it makes sense to have more women on boards and more women at the top. So let's talk about that good news that has happened for women. Things have changed since I started my career long ago. And so we are making progress, and let me share some of that with you. First of all, I'm sure you have all read, it came out a couple years ago, we're equal male, female in the workplace now. So we're starting off sort of 50-50, if you will. Secondly, I don't know if you know the data on women in education at this point, but two out of every three diplomas now are going to women. Women are going in record numbers to business school, law school, medical school. We're still a little behind in science and math. We're coming out with great resumes. We're getting hired. And yes, we are having great success early on in our careers. We're going to get promoted one, two, maybe three times. But then you hit that point, that mid-career stall out. And that's what we've been studying. What happens at mid-career? Why by the time we get to mid-career is it so hard? Are the hurdles so hard? And we seem not to get to the top. That's the question we're studying. 
So let me tell you where we are. Let's look at the status right now. We've got 14.1% women executives, and that's C-suite and one level down. All this data comes from the Catalyst organization, not-for-profit, that studies the status of women. So 14.1 at the top, 16.1 on boards. And I know for a fact some boards have three, four women, so a lot of boards have no women. And finally, 19, 19 out of 500 uh, Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Well, I think that's sort of pitiful. I really do. I can't believe that's as far as we've been able to get at this point. So my firm, we've been studying. We've now coached over 1,000 women. We've trained over 7,000 women. And we have talked to 3,000 executives in this primarily Fortune 1,000 companies. We've talked to 3,000 executives about those women. And the themes began to emerge for us, and this is what was the foundation eventually of our book. And our themes are that there's certain behavior patterns that we women engage in that hold us back from getting, where, getting us where we want to go. And as a coach and a person who uh, believes in sisterhood and the support of women, there is so much now, we need to take charge of our careers, we need to make some things happen, and we need to be honest with each other. So this is not aimed at corporate America or government or society or anything. This is about us. What can we women do? So I want to have a little coaching session with you right now, a little personal coaching session. And I'm going to tell you some things that might be going on with you that you might want to reconsider, that you might want to break a rule, and I'm going to throw some new ideas out there. And for you men in the audience, I think some of what I'm going to talk about will resonate with you. And think about your female colleagues, your daughters, the women in your life. Maybe something I'm going to talk about today you can use in coaching and supporting them. So I'm thrilled you're here to hear this because you're, you're part of this as well. So let's go to these rules. Let's, let's start off with rule number one. And I am, this is a woman's leadership conversation, so I'm primarily talking to women. Are you a focus on other women? Do you, are you a natural nurturer? And I know there are a lot of you out there where you're very busy taking care of everyone in your lives. Not only your family, your aging parents, but you go to the office and you take care of your boss and your clients and your team. And what happens at the end of the day? You come home, you're exhausted, you flop on the couch go to sleep, and the next day you get up and do it all over again. What's missing in that equation? You. That's what's missing in that equation. So I want you to think about the new rule I'm proposing. Here's the new rule. Take center stage. Now, what does this mean? It means a couple things to me. First of all, great women leaders are very resilient. You've got to learn how to be resilient. You've got to take care of yourself, be healthy, whatever it takes to do that. Take some time for yourself. The other part of that is you need some of this time to think about your own career. You've got to be okay being center stage and, yes, a little selfish for yourself because you need to be purposeful and intentional and strategic about your career. And if you don't take a moment and think about it, your career can bat you around as opposed to having the directions that you want to go. So that's rule number one. Are you one of those people? So you might want to think about um, putting some time and effort and some thought some meditation, if you will, into your future career. Rule number two, the old rule, are you a be modest person? That's the person that you compliment and they can't take the compliment. You say, you look great, that's a great dress, oh, this old thing. Or someone comes off the stage, they've done a fabulous job, and you say, Mary, you did a wonderful job. And what do I say? Oh, it's nothing, nothing at all. After you put all that energy. If you're one of those people, you're also probably somebody who can't self-promote. You're uncomfortable talking about your successes, your strengths, what you're proud of. It feels arrogant or bragging. Now, I had a wonderful Southern mother who, when I was very little, said to me, Mary, you're way too bossy and you brag way too much and you're never going to have any friends. <laughs> So my husband will tell you I'm still bossy, but I stop bragging. So I go to Sixth Avenue Publishing Fortune 500, 
I walk in the door. I'm 21 years old. I'm from a teeny tiny town in North Carolina. I went to a school that most people up here had not heard of, and I walk in the door of the Ivy League environment. Now, how do you think my Be Modest style worked? It didn't. So the first time I was stepped over for a job I really deserved and I really wanted, and I was personally wounded by that, I realized I had not been telling people what I was doing. We think senior management's omnipotent, and if I just work hard, do a quality job, everyone's going to know it, but they don't. You must learn to effectively self-promote, and it doesn't have to be bragging. You can do some sneaky bragging. You can have other people brag for you. <laughs> there are other ways to do it. You don't have to do it yourself. Because what I want you to do is project personal power. You know, people who have that inner core confidence that what they're doing is really good, they bring the passion to the conversation. And they say, I had such a great time at the TED Talk. You know, I love talking to people about my favorite topic. And I think it went pretty well. I feel pretty good about it. You know, it's a challenge, but it felt good. That's a brag. I'm bragging to the next person I'm going to talk to. But it's coming from an authentic place. It's really the truth. So if it's the truth, it's not bragging. If you're exaggerating, then it is. So I want you to think about that. If you have a hard time speaking up for yourself, think about how you can learn to com comfortably self-promote. There are a lot of great books out there about it. Brag is a four-letter word, toot your own horn. So look those up if that's something that speaks to you. Because we women need to get comfortable with power. We need to get comfortable showing up, being ready, being organized and prepared, feeling good about how we look, because that's when it's all hitting on all cylinders that we're going to speak up and get our, our voice at that leadership table, which is really what I want you to do. Number three, seek approval. This is really my biggie. I'm an ENFJ on Myers-Briggs, and I have a very, very big F feeling, people person. I believe that harmony is the highest value. I hate conflict. I want, I want to be a crowd pleaser. I want everyone to come to the meeting. We talk, we make a decision, everybody leaves agreeing, and they're happy. I'm a consensus builder. And that is in my DNA. That's the kind of person I am. So again, that can work in corporate America, but not all the time. Sometimes you have to make a tough decision quickly. And then, uh-oh, somebody may not like my decision. Somebody may not like me. Very hard for me to come to grips with. So what happened is I got known as, she's too nice. So when I would say, now why am I not getting this job? Well, we don't know if you can do the tough stuff. So I had to do what I'm telling you all to do. Figure out how to remain true to who I am, ENFJ, and be an effective, powerful, senior woman leader. How am I going to do this? So I had to struggle with it and think about if I'm making the right decision and I'm being fair, yeah, I may disappoint some people, but hopefully they'll get over it and they'll understand it and we'll still remain colleagues. So I had to get a little tougher about it. Another seek approval point of view is sort of picking places to work where you love everybody that you're going to work with because that's your highest value. And yes, we want to work with people we like to work with, but I, I did not choose strategically within my corporation where I was going to work. I went to work where I liked the people as opposed to some of the function I needed to learn. So it took me longer to get where I wanted to go to the C-suite. It took me a lot longer. And finally, the seek approval person goes into the boss in the supplicant position and asks, may I please do that? We're always asking for permission, sort of the good girl thing. You need to get empowered. I want you to consider the new rule. Proceed until apprehended. <laughs> be courageous. Be brave. Go do it. Ask for forgiveness. Don't ask for permission. Be empowered. That's what, how management looks at us. That's when we get noticed because we're out there doing it. We're not afraid to go ahead and do it. Now, am I telling you to go off like a loose cannon and do something crazy? No. But what I am saying, think about, are you, are you one of these be modest people? And I'll, I'll digress a minute. I've spent a long time in my life trying to get the people around me to do what I wanted them to do, to be who I wanted them to be, and you know how effective that is. It's not. And in coaching, what I coach my women to do is to change on the, on the margin, do a little something. We have to be who we are or we'll be phony and you will not it will not work if you're phony. So you have to figure out 
how to be true to yourself and be more effective. And right now, in corporate America, there's so few of us at the top that it's hard to, it's a struggle. It's not easy. I'm not saying anything I'm talking today about is easy because it's a struggle to figure out how to be both and feel good about ourselves. But I want you like to think about your clicker, click up a notch, down a notch. That's all I want you to do. And if you leave here being willing to do one thing differently, I will be thrilled. So you know, listen as I go through. If, you, if your number one has not come up yet, hopefully I'll hit it before we, we finish. Number four, all or nothing thinking. Are you a black and white thinker? Do you want to see everything one way or the other? I think as women in our personal lives, we deal really well with our personal, the fuzziness of our, the messiness of our personal lives. I think we do a great job. But when we get in the workplace, we want it to be neat and tidy, fair, organized, no ambiguity, no gray space. And as you know, the world today is full of gray space. And we got to get comfortable living in that, um, feeling uncomfortable about it. We rush to check it off our list so that that little niggly thing hanging over your head at work is done. And we shut off options. Don't shut options off until you absolutely have to. So what I want you to think about is both and. I'm not generally a black and white thinker, but when I'm tired and emotional, I'm a black and white thinker. Well, I've had it. If this corporation thinks they're gonna to continue to do this to me, they're wrong, I'm through, I've had it, the last straw, whatever your words are, and I'm leaving. And I have been there a couple of times when I was really ready to quit, and I was really coming from an emotional place. So I was very much seeing it black and white. I've gotta leave. I'm gonna opt out and forget it. You need truth tellers in your life. You need people you can go to to talk to when you get to that emotional moment. Somebody who can pull you back and get you back over to your rational brain and have you think through pros and cons. Maybe you should leave. I don't know. But don't do it in an emotional huff. And be willing to live in the gray space. That's what leaders today have to do. Live in the world of ambiguity. And we as women have to get comfortable doing that. All right. How many people here think if you just worked harder, you'll get promoted? <laughs> How many out there? Yep. Some of you are right. If you're early on in your career, working harder is, is what you need to do. Because you're showing, you're building your craft, your skill. You know, you show them that you will work hard and it's needed. But when you get to mid-career, working harder is not going to get you there. What's going to get you there is being politically savvy. And I will tell you, from all the women I coach, this is the one they hate the most. Office politics. Ugh. Don't want to even talk about that. You know, something sort of tainted dirty about politics. Well, let me tell you, you have to know how your organization works. You have to know how it really works behind the curtain as well as in front of the curtain. Who are the power players? How do you get promoted? How are decisions made? Are decisions made in the meeting or the meeting before the meeting? If it's meeting before the meeting and you don't get talked to, then you don't get your voice at the table. So you've got to take some time and be an observer. Be savvy, be smart. I will tell you, the first day I walked into Time Incorporated, I met Linda. She's still my dear friend. And I came to find out that Linda was the most politically savvy person I've ever met in my life. She was never wrong. We'd come out of a meeting scratching our heads, and I'd say, what do you think just happened in here? She said, well, I, would, she said, I think this. i say, no, no, I think this. She was always right. So if you're not good at this, if you can't read between the tea leaves, get a Linda. Find a Linda. Find a Larry. Find somebody. Go find somebody who can help you do this. The second stage of this I leave in your hands. What you decide to do with all the information you come up with, that's when you get political. That's your choice. That's your moral compass and code. You decide how you're going to do that. But to be in a corporation in mid-ranks or higher up and to think you don't have to understand the political structure of your organization is very naive. And so we women see, personally, we'll handle it. You want to get your kid in a certain school or a certain teacher? We women will be as political as we need to be to make it happen. But when it comes to our careers, and in our career, we don't want to do it for ourselves. So we can do it. We have the skill and talent to do it. It's a decision about how you do it. It's a nuance. I'm going to end on my favorite, are you playing it safe? Are all your pots on simmer? You know just how your day is going to be? You know exactly when you leave home in the morning how it's going to feel? 
and you may be just a tad bored, you're in your comfort zone. You feel good about that. All right, the phone rings, the big boss is calling you, and the big boss says, got a fantastic stretch assignment for you. Really want you to do it. What's going through your head? Are you saying, yeah, 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 let it be me? Or are you saying, oh, no, no, don't let it be me. I'm not ready for this. I don't want to do this. This is too scary. What that boss has done is put you out of your comfort zone, and it doesn't feel very safe feels very scary and very risky because, hey, maybe I can't do this job. Paradoxically, when we're out of our comfort zone and feeling awkward, we're growing. So it's a good place to be. It's a very good place to be. Um, women, we women think we need to know 80% of a new job. Men think they need to know 20% of a new job. <laughs> Kudos to you men. You know what they're saying? I'm confident. I've done it before. I'm going to go for it hey, this is a big opportunity for me. When we're sitting here being analytical about how we're going to fail, we go right to the negative place, how it won't work, how we can't do it. The reason I bring this up is big stretch assignments are how you show management what you can really do. It shows you're brave, courageous, fungible, an agile learner, all those things. So it really puts you in such a strong position because I want all you women out there to be one of my 30%. I want you to help me get 30% up in the right. So whatever your career dreams are, wherever you want to go with your career, I want you to have it. So I want to end with my favorite Eleanor Roosevelt quote. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. I want you to believe in the beauty of your career dreams. I want you to have it. I want you to be one of my 30% because I know corporate America will be a better place with more women so please be one of my women. Thank you.